Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be talking about water gameplay in Age of Empires 2 and in fact we're going to cover everything you need to know about water gameplay. So if you're struggling with water gameplay or if you know a friend of yours, maybe someone you saw on Reddit or Discord that couldn't quite grasp it for just water maps or hybrid maps, just refer them to this video because I'm sure I'm going to pack all the information needed. We'll cover the basics and the surface level stuff and I'll also include some pro tips so even some of my more veteran viewers can benefit from this video. So we have three main categories to cover. The first one is naval combat and how it works. I'm going to talk about the rock paper scissors element of the basic ships then i'll also cover all the unique warships and i'll talk about some of the warship upgrades and how those work and then the next category is fishing ships and water economy and how fish booming actually works i'm going to cover fish trapping versus deep sea fish expanding when you win water on a water map and then number three is simply landing and how that works and i'm also going to cover all of the remaining dock upgrades that are somewhat pertinent to landing as well before we truly begin though make sure to follow me on twitch for the live streams link in the description below we love to see the YouTube guys come over there and say hello to us as we're live streaming. We have a great community there and it's good to add to it and keep that growing. It's a good way to support me as well. And with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and take a look at some water gameplay. All right, so for the first category, it's all about the naval combat here. Naval combat is super important to understand because you cannot benefit from water without actually winning it and forcing your opponent off that water first. Because if you're both on water with naval ships, then no one truly controls it and no one can really benefit from its control. So a water battle is just bound to happen, be it on a map like Four Lakes where there's fishing ships and you know all those extra resources you can get from water and that players will fight over. And then islands where controlling the water enables landing. You can control the middle islands with extra resources etc. Water control is very important and being able to beat your opponent off water to then benefit from it is a very key step. However, that being said, water gameplay or naval combat can be a little bit confusing because you have quite a few ships available to you and they're all coming out of the dock. So it's one production building that opens up so many options. Let's take a look first at the basic ships to understand how those work. So there are three basic ships. You've got the fire ship line or fire galley to fast fire ship. Then you got the galley that leads into the galleon and then you have the demolition raft that leads into to the heavy demolition ship. So the way this works is in a rock, paper, scissors format where one beats the other, the other beats the third, and the third beats the first. So in this case, we have the fire ship, which is supposed to be beating the galley, and then the galley, which is supposedly beating the demo, and then the demo, which is beating the fire. Now I said supposedly because to be honest, this rock, paper, scissors format is just simply a overall basic outlook, but it's not that simple. It's actually a little bit more complex. Don't worry, we're gonna get into it and break it down. So as a general rule when it comes to the fire galleys is that they don't need any upgrades. They're actually fully upgraded right out of the get-go. The only way to upgrade them is with the dock text. You don't need something like fletching to boost the attack or range. They also shoot a projectile that could be blocked. So anything in front of the fire ship as it's attacking will take the damage. It kind of operates in a very unique fashion where its projectile isn't targeted at anything specific. It just kind of shoots in a straight line and whatever is connecting with that attack or with that projectile first is getting hit and will take the damage. And then the demolition ship is a very fast moving yet very fragile ship. However, it doesn't really take that much damage from the fire galley or from the fire line. And so the demolition ships running at fire galleys, it usually means that you're going to get some good impacts. And the way to make demolition ships get value is to simply use your one unit and explode it on multiple of your opponent's units. That is the best and maybe the only way to get good value out of a demolition ship as if you just use one demolition ship to attack one unit, it usually won't be that worth it. Demolition ships are also extremely good against land units. So that's an added plus. And as far as the galley they are a ship that truly scales with upgrades and they scale with mass so the more of them you have the more dps you're doing this is because they operate similar to an archer like on land gameplay with an archer if you just have a group of one or two they're not that strong if you have a group of 20 or 30 they suddenly become very powerful this is because they can all attack at the exact same time they don't all have to be in a certain range they have a good amount of range already so as soon as you attack all of them can shoot and then all of them can reload as you move away this is exactly how an archer works on land and it's the same way for the galley on water. They are upgraded by getting the fletching upgrades from the blacksmith as well as ballistics and chemistry from the university and that's on top of all the dock upgrades that you could benefit from. So as you can see the fire galley is more of like a very fast out of the gate powerhouse. The demolition ship serves as a counter to mass fire galleys and then the galley is a ship that counters the demolition ship as it's very squishy and you can easily take it out and it scales really well. So over time the galley can actually beat the fire galley if you get enough of them out in the field. Okay now that I've introduced a bit of nuance to the rock paper scissors 
dynamic, let's take a look at some general rules and exceptions when it comes to this rock, paper, scissors format. So in general, when it comes to really big water masses, let's say something like islands, team islands, even Northern Isles to some extent, there's a lot of space to maneuver. So we're talking big water, big oceans. Galleys would be better than everything if you can get to the mass. This is because you have so much distance to micromanage and there's always a place to run. And because galleys move faster than fire galleys, you can always hit. And then if the fight gets tough, you can just run away and you're gonna make it out. Also, if you're winning the fight, you can attack fire galleys and then chase them down. And so if you're winning fights with the galleys, you're basically unstoppable and you're controlling everything. However, this comes as a little bit of a cost. We already talked about how going for galleys and upgrading them is more expensive than the fire galley. And if the fire galley player gets to the next age and goes for fire ships or fast fire ships, they are much stronger than the galley line if you're an age up. This is an interesting concept because it gives the fire galley player a way out of dealing with mass galleys. So instead of him trying to win in feudal age against mass galleys, he simply tries to get up to castle age and then text into the fire ship. This fire ship will be much tankier and much stronger than the fire galley and allow him to destroy the enemy galleys. Same concept for imperial age. If you're up against mass war galley, your fire ships will die pretty hard. But if you get the imp and you go for fast fire ships, you will destroy mass war galley with even fewer numbers than you'd expect. And then another rule when it comes to demolition ships is that they are insane against fire ships in castle age onwards. In feudal age, the demolition raft versus the fire galley, the demo raft wins and it's, you know, supposedly a good counter, but you kind of need to rely on good shots. Whereas in castle age, the demolition ship is so tanky. It literally doesn't die to fire ships whatsoever. It takes so long for them to kill it. So you can just run in, tank a little bit, body block the fire ship. Like I talked about earlier, you know, if you're standing in front of the enemy fire ship and it's attacking you, the demolition ship can actually tank the damage for quite a while and then explode. So it acts as both a tank and a demo ship and it moves faster than fire. So you can literally chase him down and get the shots you're wanting. Obviously the demo will still die to mass war galley in Castle Age, but for all intents and purposes, for what it's meant to be doing in Castle Age, it's like super broken. And same concept, the nymph, the heavy demolition ship is insanely broken for a similar concept. And even against mass galleon, sometimes the demolition ship can actually be worth it if you run 10 in and if you get good connections, heavy demo is insane. So a bit of an exception to the rule there going into the Imperial Age. Before we talk about the unique warships though, I need to talk about a few upgrades that are important to consider when talking about water combat. All right, the first upgrade we have to talk about is the war galley upgrade. Now the war galley upgrade will upgrade all of your ships in the feudal age to their next age version. So fire galley will go to fire ship, demolition raft will go to demolition ship, and galley will go to war galley. This upgrade doesn't even show up when you're looking at the tech tree for some reason. I was actually looking at it when recording this and couldn't find it, which is really awkward, but it just appears in the second page of the dock, which is also awkward by the way. And it's understandable why new players don't even understand how to upgrade their units or where to find this upgrade. So it's in the second page of the dock and it upgrades all three of the basic units. However, in Imperial Age, all three of the basic unit lines will have their own upgrade separately. So fast fire ship, heavy demolition ship, and galleon techs will all be separate techs. This is a very unique concept in Age of Empires. You can't find this anywhere else where one upgrade affects three different units. And this is because in water gameplay, you tend to mix these units very often going from Feudal Age to Castle Age. So by making it one tech that upgrades all three units, it makes it so you have that flexibility without needing to tech into something specific. Obviously going into imp, having a lot more economy and more resources available. So being forced to tech into what you want to go for adds a little bit of strategic choice and strategic dynamic. So this is actually a really nice option that the devs chose. It's just a little bit confusing to the newer players. The other upgrades worth mentioning are dry dock, careening, and shipwrights. So careening is in castle age and it just gives plus one pierce armor to your ships. And it also gives transport ships extra carry capacity, which we'll talk about later. The plus one pierce armor is definitely very nice, especially against the war galley line. Dry dock makes your ships move 15% faster and gives your transport ships plus 10 carry capacity, which we'll, again, we'll talk about later, but ships moving faster is always good, affects pretty much every ship. And then you've got the ship right as well, which is at a thousand food, 300 gold. So very expensive upgrade, but it makes your ships cost 20% less wood and build 35% faster. So it helps your production speed and it helps your production cost, which is a really important upgrade in the late game. Not every sieve in the game has these upgrades. Careening, every sieve has it, but dry dock and ship rights, some sieves have them and some sieves don't. All right, the last unit I need to talk about before covering the unique warships is the cannon galleon. Simply put, the cannon galleon is just there to take out buildings from the water. It's really useful when you have water control on maps like Baltic or Mediterranean or even islands where you can stand on the water and take down all of your opponent's castles, all of your opponent's docks, and all of your opponent's important buildings that they have closer to shore. It has a lot of range, so winning water in late game and using the cannon galleon has a ton of impact. And it's pretty much the reason why water is so important and you just can't give it up in water maps. 
All right, moving on to the unique warships now. This is where it truly gets interesting. So there are actually a few unique warships I'm gonna cover. Starting things off with the longboat, which is probably the most iconic unique warship. Now the longboat is really easy to micro and it's similar to the galley where it's very smooth and not, not a big unit that's clunky and, and bumps on everything. The, the longboat is very, very smooth and it's available in Castellage without requiring an upgrade. So the Vikings get access to it right away. And it's excellent against fire ships because it fires multiple arrows and fire ships have high pierce armor, which makes them usually pretty good against the galley line well the longboat doesn't care about that pierce armor since it fires multiple arrows and that kind of overcomes the pierce armor that the fires have the longboat is basically just a well-rounded really really strong unit borderline overpowered and its only downside is that it's slightly more expensive than a galley but it's easy to use it bunches up and groups up really nicely so it's easy to micro and hitting and running is super solid it also moves faster than most ships and can be excellent at chasing down fire ships only downsides i can think of besides its price is that it, because it groups up it could be weak to demolition ships and Romans, which we'll talk about a bit later. Next unit is the Dravidian's unique unit, Theory Side Eye. This is available in Imperial Age without needing any upgrade. Uh, and it's an interesting unit because it, in theory, it's really pop efficient. It's a very strong unit for its one population cost. And although it's really expensive, as far as resources goes, it's basically double the resources of a galleon after shipwright. It does put out a lot of you know power for its punch. The only problem though, is that it's extremely clunky. And because it's so expensive, it's hard to get to like that 200 pop theory side eye dream composition so i would say it's a good option in late game but if you're trying to win back the water or if you don't have that many resources available it's a terrible option it's also pretty bad against fire ships so you only really want to make it against galleons and longboats uh, i will say it's the one ship that it really counters is the caravel which is the portuguese unique unit so if you're up, ever up against that then theory side eye makes the most sense now let's talk about the caravel which is the unique unit of the portuguese this is basically a scorpion on the water its projectiles will do pass through damage which makes it excellent excellent against longboats that tend to group up, and it's also pretty decent against galleons. It is subpar against fire ships and demos though, but it still does okay against those units. Overall, the Caraval is a pretty strong late game option for the Portuguese. Next up, we have arguably the most overpowered unit, which is the Droman. The Droman is available to a few civilizations and it replaces their cannon galleon. It's also really good against buildings like the cannon galleon, but on top of that, it is extremely good against ships because it's basically a mangonel that can attack ground and it's on the water with extra range. Also, the Droman doesn't need chemistry to get going, so it is quite literally a really broken unit that comes out straight away in Imperial Age. I made a whole video on Dromans because it's a really interesting topic. Maybe if my editor can flash a picture of it on the screen so you guys can check that out if you're interested. But basically, it destroys longboats if they aren't careful and they group up, and it's basically good versus everything, both land units, water units, and also buildings. And then lastly, we have the turtle ship, which is a very iconic unit, and unfortunately, it's just not that good. It's great on small ponds. It does okay versus demos and fires, and it's really good if you get into castle faster, but it's expensive, slow, and a bit clunky, so it's pretty bad against mass war galley, and it's pretty bad in imp when there's so many units on the field, and you just don't get to even join the combat with the turtle ships. The turtle ships do some splash damage, though, so they could be okay against, you know, mass group units, but not the best. It's pretty situational. The last thing I want to cover for naval combat is just a general rule to end off the section. On big water maps like islands and team islands and where there's a lot of water, generally speaking, galleys are going to be your go-to option. On smaller hybrid maps where small bodies of water are present, then generally speaking, your best option is going to be the fire ship line and that's in combination with demos. So you have two main strategies with naval combat. You either go for a mix of fire galleys and demos or you go for pure galleys. The reason why you don't mix when you go with galleys is because you want to mass them up as much as possible, get fletching, and get that unstoppable mass as fast as possible. Of course, there are situations where you're going to tech switch from one to the other, depending on the situation, but those two are the general two opening strategies, and from there, you can develop into whatever you see fits best. Okay, that was the longest section of the video, and I hope you guys did enjoy it. Next up, we're going to move to the economy part of the dock. Now, when it comes to just a standard opening on a lot of hybrid maps or some water maps, making a dock with fishing ships from Dark Age is pretty much always worth it. Like it's a blanket statement, I know, but I would say it's 90%, 95% of the time, it's worth it to make a dock in fishing ships, even if you lose the dock immediately upon hitting Feudal Age and you lose all your fish. The reason for this is because the dock basically acts as an extra town center in Feudal Age. You invest a little bit of wood to make a dock and fishing ships, and those fishing ships don't impact your town center production. If you do a build correctly, which I have 
tons of builders in my strategy guide available for my Twitch subs and Patreon members. Link in description, shameless plug, I know. But I couldn't resist because if you know the proper build order for the early game water strategy, then you'll know that your TC will always be running, making villagers, villagers gathering resources. And then on top of that, you have the dock that's gonna be making three or four fishing ships, which will pay back by the time Feudal Age comes in. Then once Feudal Age comes in, if you keep those fish alive, it's only profits. And if you lose them, well, we lost them, but we broke even. And that is the worst case scenario when going for a dock and fishing ships, if done correctly. However, the bonus to the situation is that if you actually win the water and you go for like some galleys or fire galleys and demos, and you manage to win the water, force your opponent off it and kill their dock, then you can add in extra fishing ships. And what you could do, a little pro tip, is add more docks along the shore where there's a lot of deep sea fish and let your fishing ships continue to feast on all the deep sea fish by adding in more. So within like two, three minutes of winning water, you can have like 10 fishing ships within a couple extra docks and another two, three minutes, you might have 20 fishing ships and more docks to sustain them and keep docking along the shore to make sure that the deep sea fish you're taking is going to be close to a nearby dock so the fishing ships don't have to travel too much while dropping off that food. This is what is called fish booming and it's not the fish booming that you'll see on Black Forest with the private ponds. It's not the fish booming you're going to see in Viper's thumbnail where he's got his face there with three docks with perfect fish traps. We're going to talk about that because that's also really cool but this one is more of like the classic fish boom when you win water on maps like islands and baltic and whatnot okay now about the viper fish boom with the bf and private ponds this is something that it's honestly a really big skill and there's guys like viper and tato that do it so well i'm pretty i'm pretty bad at it myself but i've seen it done tons and tons of times and it looks fantastic basically the way it works is those private ponds that have a tiny amount of fish like two three shore fish by using a dock and a few fishing ships you're able to take what little food there is and then make fish traps really close to the dock to basically get insane food income that doesn't come from farms. The benefit of doing this is not necessarily the gather rate of the fishing ships, which is pretty good after gill nets. I don't know the exact number, but it's comparable to a farm with heavy plow, if not slightly better. But that's not the main benefit. The main benefit is the fact that the fish traps are really wood efficient. For just 100 wood to make a fish trap, the fish trap has like 900 food or something crazy like that straight out the get-go, whereas a farm only starts with 175 food without horse collar and then goes to 250 with horse collar, and that costs you 60 wood. So it's a really good conversion ratio of wood to food and that's the reason why fish trapping is so good and obviously you can get as crazy as you want with this if you can fit a dock and a few fish traps and you can usually get like let's say eight to ten fish traps per dock you can just do this on repeat non-stop until you're satisfied with the food income that you have set up and this will be completely different than your villagers and what they're doing on land so you can have 3 tc boom on land gathering mainly stone gold and wood and let your water economy with the sm few small ponds that you get take care of all of your food income and this is a, usually a really good strategy on black forest where your private ponds can't be interrupted the one danger of the strategy is that if there's any risk of you losing the pond i would recommend not doing this because the risk of losing your pond is huge if you lose your pond and you have 20 fish traps that's basically all of your food income going down the drain and it's really easy to kill fish traps and fishing ships with land units if they come in with the right setup and you can lose so much value one shot and it could be hard to recover. So only do this fish trap boom if you're completely secure and you know no one's gonna disrupt it. So on maps like Baltic, where you have like some water control, but it's not that stable, fish trapping is usually not good because if you start fish trapping, then the guy redox, wins the water back and kills all your fish. Suddenly you're just so screwed because you invested so much into the fish traps. The tech I wanna talk about in this section is gill nets. Gill nets is pretty much always worth it if you're investing into any kind of fish boom. So if you're investing into the fish trap fish boom, gill nets is like top priority. If you're investing into the I1 water and I'm a fish for the deep sea fish boom with the extra docks that I talked about earlier, then getting gill nets after about like eight fishing ships is usually a pretty good idea. So if you can squeeze it in, it'll probably pay back rather quickly. The last thing I want to talk about is just the fishing rates for the fishing ships. Now I don't deal with exact numbers. For those, you're going to have to visit Spirit of the Law, the goats of Age of Empires 2 YouTube. But uh, for me personally, I just deal with concepts. So simple concepts for the fishing ships. If they're gathering from shore fish, it's much slower. It's actually pretty bad. And if they're gathering from deep sea fish, it's very good. One of the fastest food sources in the game. And if they're gathering from fish trap, it's about okay until you get gill nets then it becomes very good this is of course completely different when it comes to a villager a villager gathering from fish from shore fish or deep sea fish is the same and it's actually the fastest food source in the game for a villager so really important information there when it comes to fishing fishing ships and villagers gathering from water
Okay, now to move on to the third and last section, we're gonna talk about landing and how that works in the early, mid, and late game. Now, when it comes to early game landing, this usually takes over your entire strategy. On a map like Islands, where you can't attack your opponent on land without making a transfer ship, you're gonna have to make a transfer ship if you plan to do this. The way to usually do this is to make a transfer ship on the way up to Feudal Age, fill it with your scout and four villagers, go over to your opponent's land and make production buildings there. It's much easier to transport villagers and make the production buildings there than to transport individual military units because in individual military units will be like a lot of back and forth trips. You have to make the buildings at home, make the units, take them to transport, send them over and then go back. This is not a good strategy for early game, especially if you don't have water control. If you don't have water control and you're transporting and your opponent catches your transport, you're going to lose all of the units in that if he sinks it. So that's a very risky strategy. That is why players will just land the villagers and make the production on the enemy island. This is a really good strategy if you want to catch your opponent off guard and take the battle to their land instead of on water. Keep in mind if you do this, you're likely to lose water because doing a landing while fighting on water is usually just a little bit too much and like Bilbo Baggins you're spreading yourself a little too thin. In the mid game however when it comes to like castle age gameplay you can definitely make a few knights at home and then send them over on a rogue transfer ship. The reason why this is viable and not so much in feudal age is because knights on their own can do so much damage and just a couple knights is pretty worth it to send over with a transfer ship whereas a couple archers in feudal probably not going to achieve that that much. So in the castle age if you've got a couple stables set up on your base and you're transporting over some knights you can get some pretty good value with that. Same concept goes in Imperial Age. In Imperial Age, I'd actually recommend transporting mainly uh, military units because making military on your land will prevent your opponent from landing you because you're going to have the military there to defend yourself. And then when you have the chance, you can transport 20 units at a time if you get the text or if you get the right text. And then with 20 units at a time, you can transport siege, you can transport war elephants if you want, you can transport paladins, halberdiers, literally anything. And if you combine that with transporting some villagers as well, you can surprise your opponent with 40, 50 military units, then 10 villagers to make a forward castle. And all of a sudden, the whole game is a completely different scenario. So landing is a high risk, but it's also a really high reward approach. I would say proceed with caution, but definitely don't neglect the strategy. The techs needed for landings to be successful are dry dock and careening. Careening and castage gives you plus five carry capacity and dry dock gives you plus 10 carry capacity and also makes your transport ship move a little faster just to sneak out there a little bit quicker every time and avoid some enemy fire. In general, I would say don't go for landings if you don't need to. So if you're connected by land, usually just taking that is going to be a little bit better because transporting with transfer ships is a little bit clunky and can be a bit awkward and time consuming at times. So saving yourself the 10 clicks it takes you to put units in a transfer ship, take them over. If you just have those 10 units and there's a passage by land, it takes two clicks. You take your units, send them over and forget about them. The transfer ship takes a lot more babysitting and a lot more care. So while it's a really good approach, if needed, it is a bit clunky and a little bit you know, awkward in a lot of cases, not to mention risky. All right, that's going to do it. I'm pretty sure that's pretty much everything I know about water gameplay in Age of Empires. Let me know if I missed anything in the comments below. And if you have any more questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Also, we have a wonderful community here. So maybe someone else that's more knowledgeable can definitely answer in the comments and help people out that need some questions answered. And like I said earlier at the start of the video, if you guys do know of someone who's struggling with water gameplay, please recommend in this video. I'm making this for the entire community to benefit. And I'm pretty much the only pro player out there that is making extensive guides like this. Aside from doubt that makes one or two guides every half a year so uh definitely make sure to support me by spreading this video and so the knowledge can spread a bit more naturally thank you so much for watching like comment subscribe to support the video a bit more as well and help the algorithm and i'll see you guys in the next video take care and peace